Emily Mueller has a master's and a doctorate from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she, where she researched insect transmitted plant diseases and sustainable pest management. After working for five years with North Carolina State University Extension, Emily is now the plant healthcare specialist with the Capitol Grounds and Arboretum. Welcome, Emily. Thank you, glad to be here. Wonderful, well, to kick us off, I've gotten some questions about um, you and what you do. So let's start with um, what do you do as the plant healthcare specialist for the Capitol Grounds and Arboretum? So uh, first, welcome um, everyone, glad you're here. And thanks to Grace and her team for uh, inviting me to participate. Um, so here uh, is a nice picture just showing you uh, kind of as a zoom in on the Capitol. And if you notice, a lot of greenery surrounding the building. And that's part of my job. I work with a team of uh, colleagues and, and crews that we devote our time and our responsibilities to, to making sure that, that those areas stay green. And they're not only um, looking healthy, strong, but also having a, a low risk to, to, to the general public, but as well as to the environment. And along with that, if you see in the photo there, there's a lot of people there. We have um, people coming through throughout the, the campus on a daily basis, and they can be at all hours. And so one of the things that we have to keep in mind as a team is making sure that we can tackle and control these pests without being interfering with the general public. And also it's, a, it's an opportunity to educate with the whole concept of pest control. I think a lot of people have in their mind that it's all about chemical outputs and, and chemistries that we apply, but it has a lot um, in the terms and the concept of integrated pest management we take in a lot of different uh, control tactics uh, that aim to, to keeping our, our beautiful landscape, as you see here. Thanks, Emily. And can you tell us a little bit more about where the Capitol Grounds and Arboretum, where is that in DC? So I am um, fairly new to the DC metro area. Uh, when I got this job, I had never been, I think I was maybe 15 years old on a school trip um, to the DC area. So I thought, well, you know, where the heck exactly that? A very good question, Grace. I was like, where is it exactly? And, and downtown DC, um, here is a map just illustrating the, um, Capital is in kind of a turquoise color in the center. And highlighted in the color there, you see all of the Capitol grounds, uh, including the Library of Congress, including the Supreme Court um, landscape, uh, the United States Botanic Garden, yourselves, and then um, also us, the Capitol grounds and Arboretum. And collectively, that's it's about 300 acres. And if you look, on the map in the center, orienting yourself from the Capitol um, to the left or uh, to the east, you see Union Station, that half dome um, icon or, or map setting is the Union Station. And all of that is sort of the Senate, what we call the Senate side. And then if you look kind of the orange color, if you orient from the center with the, the turquoise Capitol building, to the right on the map, all of that is what we consider kind of the house side. And, and so we divide ourselves up into crews and so that we can effectively manage this expansive property. And um, <clears throat> along with those buildings, it also includes daycare centers uh, as well as government uh, federal buildings. And so, um, this just sorts of orients you and gives you an overall view of all of the property that we manage. Thanks, Emily. And can you tell us what are some of the pest management challenges you're facing um, at Capitol Grounds and Arboretum? So one of the things, if, if you noticed on that map, there was a lot of greenery. Um, and one of the things that 
I think people don't realize that takes a lot of constant maintenance and uh, management is our turf, um, keeping it green, keeping it healthy. We have a turf, uh, we have a team of turf specialists that work devotedly on making sure the, the turf is strong, it's healthy, what sorts of varieties do well in various areas, and also can withstand a lot of high human traffic. Um, and so that's where I'm just kind of illustrating, uh, people don't realize how much landscape is turf grass. But in addition to that, we also have a lot of challenges um, that comes with managing um, trees, a lot of high memorial commemorative trees that what we call living assets. And um, Grace, if you don't mind going back just a second um, to the previous picture, this one is uh, illustrating which people may or may not probably don't really know is that we also manage uh, green roofs. Um, there's a lot more, Congress is investing more and more efforts and uh, mission driven to be sustainable. And with that comes a uh, green live living plant material on rooftops, which we call green roofs. Uh, this is just an illustration of the Dirksen building uh, ab above, which um, nobody really sees but us, but we manage it to make sure that it's uh, not only live and doing well, as you see with all the sedum, but it's also free of weeds or any sort of um, pathogens. So, Moving, so you were saying about challenges. So a lot of the challenges that I've seen so far, just being uh, recently on board, is you know it's a nice day today, right? Everybody's like wanting to be outside. Well, that's the same idea that pests have. Pests are like, hey, it is great weather. It is time for us to find some food. Those nice new succulent leaves that are that are coming out and leafing out perfect dining buffet food for a lot of our scales uh, that are pretty um, growing exponentially right now. Um, and also that includes our new, unfortunately, it's a new invasive species that originated in Texas. And here it's called the crepe myrtle bark scale. And you can see it's uh, infesting one of our crepe myrtle trees. We have about four, almost 400 uh, trees of crepe myrtle on the campus that we need to be prepared for should this pest um, attack all of our trees. So that's uh, invasive species is one that we're concerned about. Um, in addition to the crepe myrtle, we also have other invasives that we're worried. I think a lot of people are worried about the um, lant spotted lanternfly. So um, that those are our priority challenges, but also this picture just shows you uh, some other major uh, difficulties that we're dealing with. And in the center, is just sort of urban stress. Uh, a lot of hardscape, a lot of um, pollution, compaction. And so we see a lot of our trees uh, challenged by urban stress factors. And on the left, you see that root, uh, the tree trunk really being eaten away and heavy damage. Well, that's caused by rats, uh, rat damage, rodent damage, and even we get a lot of squirrel damaging the, the trunks. And so that's a huge uh, impact on our tree health and our landscape. But in addition to that, we have on the right there, you just see a lot of our root, um, a lot of root rot and root pathogens, as you see here with that fungal mushroom um, blooming out. So we're tackling that as well. That really can constrict and confine our tree uh, health on the property. In addition to, to some other challenges, um, the campus on the Capitol specifically, we abide by uh, cultural landscape, uh, historical documents. And so boxwoods, we have almost a thousand boxwood uh, plantings. 
and our boxwoods, all almost all of them are uh, susceptible and attacked by what's called the boxwood leaf miner. And this is just a close up showing you um, its uh, immature stage, the larval stage, and uh, about ready to pupate within the leaves. They can really do some damage aesthetically. It won't kill the boxwoods, but aesthetically uh, very damaging. Thanks, Emily. And can you tell us just what are some things y'all are doing to prepare for summer pests this season? Yes, good question. Um, so in terms of um, pest management, one of the very first things that we as pest management professionals have uh, in our toolbox is to, um, let me grab this is have a um, field notebook. And this field notebook is, it's just uh, what I've been keeping track of where pests are particularly hot spots. Um, and so I've been setting up, uh, like you see in this photograph, we have uh, flagged trees. And this one in particular has a high population of soft scale. And so I've been going through the property and with a team, uh, we share knowledge and information with what hot spots we're seeing that are problematic, which ones we need to keep track of. And that being said, it's all about knowing when those populations get to a point where it starts to be um, damaging. And so that's what we call uh, economic threshold. And we want to make sure to implement a control tactic that will keep those pests from getting to that point where they're damaging the tree or the host. And so this just to prepare for the summer, um, we have been flagging certain hotspot areas with problematic pests and monitoring their pest uh, growth establishment and um, infestation levels. Thanks, Emily. And can you tell us just a little bit about some of the biocontrol methods that you're implementing on Capital Grounds? Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so one of the things that with, with such an, an integrated relationship um, with the general public, we um, have an IPM or Integrated Pest Management Plan, and it is all about reducing the need or um, having a more ecological based approach to pest management. And that being said, biological control is a huge uh, component of that. And so here on this picture is just showing you uh, a number of aphids that are infesting a plant and what we have done um, both indoor on indoor plants that we manage on site as well as outdoor is uh, releasing um, commercial uh, predators or natural enemies of these pests. And this is just a larval of a um, green lacewing and it can consume, it doesn't fly away. We can release those as eggs or as larva, but those um, green larvae, green lacewing larvae can consume a number of these soft-bodied uh, aphids in a very short period of time before they pupate and become adults. So that's one thing that we've been trying to, as the popula pest populations are still pretty low, um, we can release some of these um, natural enemies to, to, have, to have a buffet and do their natural thing. We also have been seeing a lot out, outside right now. We see a lot of natural enemies already present and uh, doing their due diligence with attacking pests. Like you see on the left, uh, the C7, what we call C7 or the seven spotted ladybird beetle. It's been very um, prominent out on the turf grass. I've seen it out and about searching for food. And on the right is just an immature stage of uh, ladybird beetle 
which when you see these guys, they're the good guy. They kind of look like prehistoric alligators, I feel like, but they are doing their, they love eating uh, scale, white flies, um, a lot of our soft bodied insects, um, as well as aphids, thrips. And so when you, when I see those guys, I know that they're doing their, a great job of attacking our soft bodied pests on the, on the campus. So in addition to in terms of not just releasing natural enemies, but biological control can also deal with uh, or utilize uh, enhancing the habitat or the environment. So, so here, uh, Botanic Gardens has a, a huge uh, plethora of flowering plants, a great diversity, and with the Capitol Grounds and Arboretum, we are at an Arboretum Level 3 status, but we do abide by cultural landscape um, historical documents, and those reports sort of leave us restricted with the types and the species of plants that we can plant. But we're trying to put pockets that encourage natural enemy habitat on the areas where they're there is sort of freedom uh, or more liberty at planting different species. Thank you so much, Emily. I think now, thanks for talking a little bit about Capital Grounds and Arboretum. Um, we're going to open it up to audience questions. We already have a few coming in. Awesome. And I think um, right on piggybacking off of those natural enemies, I'll jump in with how do you get rid of aphids? I had an infection on my hibiscus, um, which got out of control when I brought it indoors. Yes, very good question. Um, just to, to um, I can commiserate because we order a lot of plants uh, from nurseries and some of the plants that come in on site are infested with aphids and um, yeah, let, let, letting, letting them be as they are already on the plant infesting, they can definitely explode and cause a huge outbreak uh, on the property. So very good question. One of the things that um, when it comes to aphids, if the population is small, let's say with your hibiscus, you're seeing only like uh, maybe a hundred or they're just collected on one particular stem, you know, that's something that you could easily uh, wash off with a hard pressure hose, just kind of wash them off. Um, that is one easy, simple way. Another thing that you can uh, consider is insecticidal soap um, or a horticultural oil. I, I know um, my, from, from my experience is that if the concentration of the oil is more than 2%, it could cause some damage to the leaves. So I try to aim to the undersides of the leaf um, if you can, or make sure to, to get an aim because aphids like to congregate underneath leaves and, and usually along the stem. So they like to really feed in and tap into that nice um, plant sap that is easily accessible in those areas. If the population is super high, um, if you really want to bring those those plants in and are concerned with those aphids, one other thing you can consider, um, and it's to me, I think is really fascinating. But again, I'm an entomologist, so I love this stuff. But if you were to order, um, it, like say you ordered some green lacewing larva, or even eggs. They're, they're relatively cheap, you know, maybe 20 bucks or so. Um, you could release those onto your hibiscus. And uh, since it is, I'm assuming it's in a container or, or a potted plant, um, cover it with a, um, a material, a breathable material. And those, um, those lace wings could have, could have a feast. They'll, they'll knock the populations down. You, you may not even need to, to cover the plant. Um, I would just be concerned if your aphids have wings, they could be flying around, you know, infesting other plants that may be in the nearby area. 
Um, but those are all potential options. They all work. They will probably take a repeated look. I, I tend to look every week or so and just see how's the population doing. Because an aphid um, can reproduce, you know, maybe w um, a pregnant uh, or a, a mot, they reproduce um, that they reproduce exponentially. And so uh, one mother could give about maybe five or seven babies in a, in, in a day. So they, they can really explode uh, in a very short time period. So I hope that helps answer your, your question. <laughs> that was great. Thank you, Emily. Um, we've got another question here, which is, this person is saying rabbits have damaged the young trees and shrubbery over the winter, and now they've started on the young shoots in their perennial garden. Do you have um, any recommendations for deterring rabbits? Yeah, rabbits are, are stinkers. Um, so the best thing that um, we had this problem um, in, in North Carolina quite a bit as well. And the only thing that I've found that helps with deterring uh, rodents and wildlife or, or vertebrate, I should say vertebrate pests has been anything pungent, um, anything really, um, you know, they say red pepper flakes or what had uh, red, you know, a lot of the deer away or repellents. If you look at the ingredients, they often contain a lot of pungent oils or pun uh, clover uh, smelling um, peppermint is another one. And um, that is an option. Uh, spraying it around, it, it requires constant vigilance uh, and it will be washed away if the rainfall. Um, they, they definitely go after very young succulent plants. So if you know, like you have some plantings that are coming up, I mean, the best thing is to sort of protect them until they get a little bit older. Uh, if you have any sort of guard guarding or uh, hoop netting or something that can at least restrict them from gaining access. Um, the other thing is they don't like, they're kind of, they don't like pungent things like rosemary. Um, Marigold, something that would be very bitter and pungent if you want to put those sorts of plantings around as well. Not everybody likes those. They, having them in their yard, you know, you could put them in a potted plant, um, or you could also deter them away by having other sorts of more succulent. Um, uh, I would say I, I don't want detra de detracting sort of plantings. If you wanted to leave out a tray of just emerging um, spinach, um, something that would be uh, a, a deterrent, um, they would go get their buffet, so to speak, elsewhere. But um, rabbits are pretty hard. I always try to encourage. I like ecology, I like food webs. So I always try to encourage our garden snakes or our natural predators. Um, I know my brother has had huge success. They've got an owl that has decided to take uh, um, take on his little house that he built for him. So that's another option. We also here on campus have a number of predatory hawks that are helping us uh, keep at least our rat population. Mm, I don't know if I would say it's reducing, but <laughs> at least it's getting one or two on occasion. So it is a constant battle. And any any of those options, it's worth combining or finding what one may work for you. I hope that helps. Yeah, that's great, Emily. Um, our next question is, this person has ants in their compost pile, and they're wondering if that's a problem. Ants in your compost pile. So if you're turning your compost pile frequently, that temperature that's getting internally and heating and, and decomposing your leaf material or your should be enough to, to, uh, to, to kill off those ants. Um, I, that would be my concern is if they are uh, biting or if they're any sort of nuisance uh, you as a as a human um, 
I don't, that would be my first concern. If that's not the case and they are just removing, you know, plant material or what have you, uh, by con doing your, your regular routine of rotating that material, they would, um, not be able to sustain themselves. You're, you're destroying their house, so to speak. It looks like they found food in this area. Let's build a house. Let's set up, you know, let's set up home right here. And by doing that constant turning and disrupting, they're eventually going to be like, okay, this is not a good place to set up, um, set, set our tent, so to speak. And what's important about ants Ants are like uh, pollinators, uh, bees, in that they are following a social structure. And so each colony that you see of an ant colony has workers, and those workers are um, all under sort of a queen. Uh, the, the queen is who you want to get. If, we, if you wanted to put something to get at the queen, that's the bait or that's where you want to direct your attention to. And you can recognize the queen. Uh, she, she will definitely have a bigger abdomen than all the others. She's winged. Um, she just looks like a super mom. You know, everybody else kind of looks minuscule compared to, to her. And so that's one way of knowing if you are really wanting to attack and get rid of that colony. But my suggestion would be a, a more frequent rotation to disturb their habitat, get them to, to realize it's time to move elsewhere or they would die with that internal heat temperature. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, can you give any advice on Japanese beetles on knockout roses? Yes, Japanese beetles. So Japanese beetles are a nuisance, aren't they? Man. Um, so yeah, very good question. We used to have those bag of bugs. Um, I don't know if any of y'all use those, but we used to use them. My mother and father, um, live in the mountains and they would swear by them. And unfortunately, and they have um, Dr. Potter from the University of Kentucky is actually has data uh, that shows that those bag of bugs, that pheromone that attracts the Japanese beetle actually is causing more damage. And it attracts more of these adults to come to this bag of bug and it's damaging all of the vegetation surrounding those bugs. That those bags get full. I mean, it's like, hey, everybody, come hither. And um, he's actually showed data that show that those bag of bugs cause more damage and attracts more adults that don't end up in the bug, but just a bag, but end up damaging the vegetation. So that being said. One other thing that's important about Japanese beetles is that they are attracted, in my experience, they tend to be attracted to more brightly colored um, petal flowers, uh, roses, you know, the whites, the, the bright yellows. Um, if you wear a white t-shirt, they like, I don't know about you, but they would just come like, but if I wore a dark t-shirt, they don't seem to be as attracted to those bright, um, to those dark colors, I mean. And so they don't seem to cause as much damage. One thing you can consider um, if you are looking to control for um, the uh, adults, they are attracted to those bright colors and they can cause a lot of damage. One thing you can consider is putting out an insecticide, uh, specifically a systemic, for to protect your knockout roses, particularly for the ones that seem to be getting the most damage. You know, if, as you're walking through, I don't know how many different kinds you have or if you have one kind, but I definitely notice that they tend to have a preference for the types of roses that they go after or other species. You can invest in that um, if you wanted to. Um, the other option is to consider that a Japanese beetle is in, in this, um, it's called a, a scarab and their immature stage um, 
they go through, they feed on root material of many different grasses. And so that's another way of thinking about targeting the effort on the larval stage. And in a lot of different, gra uh, almost everybody I know, um, you know, has a lawn. Uh, most people have lawns and there is a product that is, um, I don't know if folks have heard of BT. Um, it is a bacterium, um, but there is a version of it called um, um, Bavariana uh, papillae. I never can say it pr properly, but it is um, something that you can apply. It's a natural uh, biological, it's a bacterium that will naturally attack specifically Japanese beetle. And you can look for that product and um, there's different brand names, but that look for that, that particular bacterium. And over time, if you spray that on your yard, it will specifically attack the larval uh, stage of Japanese beetles. And I always look at where crows or birds are picking at my yard. That usually means they're going after a robins, even uh, they're going after insects. And so I kind of usually will target those areas first. And then, um, shade it tends to be shaded areas where I see a lot of the larvae being infesting. And then you can also sample your, 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 your sod, kind of peel it up, take a little chunk, look up and see if you see any white grubs. Um, that's the immature stage and that can help with, with control as well. Um, the other thing, I, I know I'm talking a lot about this, but the other thing is um, to consider is if you really are concerned about not wanting to use any sort of chemicals or um, things that would um, that that are not environmentally in your profile, you can also consider doing um, an insecticidal soap if you would like. Uh, it's not as a, as effective, um, but it can help with at least uh, protecting some of the the knockout roses. Uh, not only with uh, a different variety of insects as well, because I know roses get hit by um, thrips. They also get hit by aphids and they're susceptible to a lot of different insect pests. I hope that helps. That is great, Emily. And then we just have a quick clarifying question. The bacterium you're talking about, is that, pardon me if I butcher this name, um, Bacillus thuringiensis? Oh. Yes. Yes. <laughs> we got there. Thank you. Thank you. I, I apologize. It's a Friday. Yes, it is a back bacillus thuringiensis. Thank you. This is why I love teens. <laughs> I Perfect. appreciate it. Whoever, whoever chimed that in, I appreciate it. But yeah, there is a specific bacillus bacterium that it, um, it's, it's, uh, the species is not thuringiensis, but it's papillae. Um, and I, I also could be butchering it as well. Um, but that is definitely going to be effective against your Japanese beetle larvae. Perfect. Thank you, Emily. Um, we've got a question about- I appreciate you bringing that up. I, yeah, I would hate to miss it. We've got some great, um, folks joining us in the chat today. Um, We've got someone who's got an infestation of phlox bugs on their phlox. Um, each year they remove all of last year's phlox debris, um, but that doesn't seem to be doing the trick to get rid of these phlox bugs. Phlox bugs. I wonder if it's a true bug. Um, I have to admit I'm not familiar with um, the, that particular pest. It would be helpful. I guess um, th the way I'm thinking about it is it really depends on if it, what type of insect it is, if it is a true bug, if it, is it a beetle, is it chewing, is it a weevil, um, is it a leaf, a foliar pest? Uh, it sounds like it might just be attacking the leaves or the flower um, petals. Um, if it is a um, a sucking pest, um, 
I would be interested in knowing more. Um, yeah, I, I just, if I knew more about the type of insect I could help with, because some of them, um, some insects go through what's called complete metamorphosis. And so they will actually uh, grow, develop, um, and then form what's called a dormant pupil um, stage. And a lot of times though, that pupa will overwinter in the soil and then the adult comes and feeds on um, the host. And then there are other insects that go through what we call, well, what I uh, usually call incomplete metamorphosis. And they will basically, um, they go from an egg, they hatch, they will be an immature stage, feed on that host, and then also just go directly into an adult. Looks very similar to the immature stage. And they don't go through that uh, dormant sort of pupil stage. So um, it would be very helpful uh, for me to know more about the type of bug uh, or insect pest that's hitting the flocks, to know more along the lines of its life cycle and its um, perhaps where it overwinters. I think we've got some more cl clues here. So they've okay. got wings they're thinking that it's um a piercing and sucking insect it looks like it is a true bug i think okay. we i think the species name is um lapidae davisi um so it's a uh, hemipteran okay so one thing i um i would i would look um you know if you've removed all the material um one thing is if it's a true bug, it's it's likely going to be laying its eggs um, on the undersides, probably closer to the stem or near the base, perhaps even near the soil line. And so looking um, underneath any of your flocks, leaf, plant, um, new growth for the year, I would uh, definitely, you would, and that brings to mind, what is very helpful because eggs are incredibly small, at least for my eyesight. I don't know about y'all, but my eyesight is um, needing help on a constant basis. And uh, this is a hand lens and I have just a uh, 10X. And this is really helpful for examining and looking for smaller aspects of um, signs of insect damage, whether it be, you know, uh, frass or excrements from lace bugs, or it be, you know, the eggs. Uh, eggs can be very small um, and difficult to, to find or locate, but that is one um, helpful tool to look for when they are Still, the flocks are looking good, and you haven't seen any indication of there being an infestation. Um, true bugs, you know, they, they, and if they're sap sucking the pest that you're recommending and they have wings, that means they're flying. The adult is likely laying eggs that will then hatch and then start causing damage, sucking into the plant sap. So I would, I would target my uh, obser um, observation and scouting at the time where they would be laying eggs um, and hatching into the young immature stage, which would be a very uh, crucial stage for control, uh, whether you are applying an insecticidal soap or a horticultural oil. Horticultural oils are effective against sap feeding insects. Um, it keeps the, that, that those oils um, help prevent that that sort of needle-like mouth part from getting into the plant and getting that plant sap and um, taking that out. So that would be my recommendation. Um, removing the plant material is also always a good uh, means of clearing off any sort of overwintering potential egg masses that could have been. But with um, this pest, it sounds like it would be something that would fly in, come lay eggs, and then um, continuously each year at the beginning of each season. 
Thanks, Emily. Um, our next question, this person has squash bugs every year and besides picking them off, is there another way to deter them? Squash bugs. Um, I get this. Th this question, uh, we would have infestations in Raleigh like you would not believe. Oh, my goodness. Squash bugs. Don't you just want to. Uh, um, <laughs> sorry. My uh, true self coming out there um, with squash bugs. Yeah, they one thing to consider, you know, is a diversity of plantings. I always try to encourage folks, if you are going to have a vegetable garden, um, that it includes a lot of our cucurbits, you know, always try to, to kind of spread them out, have a, um, a diversity of plantings so that it's very difficult for that squash bug to move from plant to plant to plant. Um, that's one thing to consider. Um, I don't know the, the sort of specifics on your property. Another thing to consider is interspersing a lot of uh, habitat that would encourage like assassin bugs or our natural enemies, building up uh, a habitat or what we call a uh, natural enemy insectary to sort of encourage our natural enemies to stay on site so that they can help with attacking those squash bugs as well. The Botanic Garden um, has a lot of beautiful uh, arrays of, of plants that have a seasonality of pollen and nectar sources for our, not just for pollinators, but also for beneficials like our natural enemies. That's one thing because uh, squash bug, um, like many other pests, if our natural enemies are present there and already uh, they don't have to travel far, they can easily attack some of our pests very quickly. And instead of spending a lot of their energy, their resources in searching for pests, because they're hungry, right? And we just went through a long winter and everybody's hungry for food. And a lot of our pests are just starting to come out in the early, like right now with the season starting. And so, the natural enemies really need to be like, okay, if I if I'm gonna find food sources, I also need to supplement with nectar and pollen and something if I don't find any pests. So the closer we can get that dynamic together, the better that our biological control can take action. Another option that you can consider is importing or buying some natural enemies uh, commercially. Uh, there are a number that can um, general general type of predators that can effectively handle uh, some of our our pest like squash bug. Um, the other thing is having our notebook, um, keeping track of when you start to see them um, squash bug start looking for the eggs. When do you start to see the uh, immature stage? When do you start to see the damage on the actual plants? Because we want to be proactive, right? Okay, if we have this notebook and I'm seeing, okay, our squash bug, I started to see damage in, uh, you know, May, May 1st. And, and so I want to backtrack and make sure I'm implementing a scouting protocol and, and keeping on track so that I can get them um, as soon as I can before they're causing damage. Uh, in Raleigh, a lot of our community gardens, we had a lot of folks that would just come through and when they saw the eggs, they would just remove, they would just remove the eggs. You know, you can, you can be really um, informal and squish it with your finger. You know, some people had cotton balls with uh, ethanol or isopropyl alcohol and just kind of swab them up if you don't, if you're concerned about the leaf um, damage. But it is definitely the earlier we are at scouting and looking, um, the better, more apt we're all we are at keeping those pests under um, a damaging level. I think a lot of times we I know I'm guilty of it. I don't pay attention to things until I already start seeing the damage. And so already I'm seeing those squash bugs attacking my squash or my cucurbits. And well, 
what what need you know what I sh- what I should have done was been looking ahead of uh, a scene before that, that they were starting to cause damage, um, and so that's another um, way. They're also with the egg stage uh, with squash bugs. You can utilize a um, like an insecticidal soap or horticultural oil to dry out those eggs as well. Um, that's another option. And then last but not least, um, I'm not saying that you shouldn't use it, but if you are amenable to using chemistries or insecticides, you can use that. Just very important that you pay attention to the re-entry period or the pre-harvest interval that is written on the label because uh, you are potentially, um, I'm hoping, going to eat your squash and um, you want to make sure that any uh, application you make is not going to be potentially harmful for, for anybody who's going to consume those, those, uh, foods. Wonderful. Thank you, Emily. Very long winded. <laughs> no, that was, well, we had shared frustration in the chat for squash bugs. So you're not alone. So I'm glad <laughs> we, we tackled squash bugs. Go team. Go team. Um, can you provide any advice uh, for getting rid of soft flies on climbing roses? This person has tried insecticidal soap, but it's hard to effectively cover the roses because they're above six feet. Um, and they've tried some, it's uh, something called seven spray, but they said it's only marginally effective. Oh, I'm glad you shared about the seven. So um, one note I I should mention about seven is that insecticide, um, it actually, there's been a lot of research done that has shown that um, unfortunately seven is, um, has a a benefit and a a, a challenge. So the benefit is it kills the bad bugs, right? Well, there's also a lot of research that has shown that it kills off a lot of the natural enemies as well. And so we often, after an application of seven, not saying seven specifically, um, um, my experience has been with that particular brand, but um, not saying that it's it's pretty much um, shown in the research that a broad spectrum insecticide like that kills off um, a lot of our natural enemies too. And so we see uh, an influx of pests after that application because of the lack of natural enemies present. So just be aware of that. Um, Do tend to uh, stay away from products like that that are kind of broad uh, spectrum. However, uh, to get at your question, I agree. I agree. When you, we have the same exact problem with a lot of our, uh, we have a significant issue with gloomy scale and some of these other uh, scale pests that are on our trees. And I mean, it's how many feet tall. And um, so we have to contract that out to get, excuse me, to get a horticultural application done specifically for the entire canopy of the the infested trees and uh, we don't we don't have that um type of equipment or um you know to really have a directed spray application like that with so many of our trees and so that being said you're right you we want to make sure we do an application that can um thoroughly cover the entire plant. And if you can't reach it, I don't know if you have access to uh, any means of getting higher up um, so that you could do uh, an application uh, more downstream. Um, The other, if you can't, you know, no problem. One thing to consider is we do have uh, a number of newer insecticides that are systemic and that, meaning they are taken up in the plant. And usually they can be effective for, um, you know, a, a range of uh, two to four weeks, really depending on the size of the plant that we're wanting to, to protect as well as the type of product. But um, I'm, uh, I would say take into 
take into consideration maybe looking for a systemic uh, insecticide if that's um, that is labeled for for use on on uh, your climbing rows. It was climbing rows, right? I think. Um, the other thing is to consider um, when it comes to applications, uh, getting making sure to target it at an early stage. Also, when um, those lar those larvae are still small, the late the the bigger those larvae get, and the the later in their life stage, the closer and closer they get to the adult stage, the harder it is to control for. They're most susceptible at the egg and sort of first instar or young uh, immature stage. It's really where if we are going to implement a uh, control, whether it be a chemical or whether it be a botanical based uh, product, we really want to target when they're, they're young uh, eggs or uh, very first uh, instar, most um, real small and immature. So. And if you you can't get access to the entire plant, I would really uh, you know consider ways that you could if you have a ladder, if you can um, maybe uh, contract it out to have a service do it. But you're right, without a thorough covering, it's really not going to benefit uh, unless maybe you do a systemic with a soil drench uh, with an insecticide or type product. And there are a number of products that are safer. A lot of people have, a. Um, there's been so much research that has gone into the development of um, insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, that they are getting more and more uh, targeted for specific pests and uh, a lot less harmful to the environment. So worth checking out uh, products available. Thanks, Emily. Um, can you provide any, oh, pardon me. Can, uh, this person has raised beds in their community garden and then last year something dug under and got to their sweet potatoes. Is there any way you can deter digging? Deter digging. Do you have, um, <laughs> very good question. <laughs> we have that very issue with rat burrows in um throughout our property here and the only thing that is going to deter digging like like rodent rodents um you know rats are they're constantly needing to to gnaw down their teeth and so if you had something that went and dug under your raised bed the best thing that would that i can think of on the top of my head to recommend is putting in barrier uh, fencing down. Um, we had to do that a lot in in our in back in North Carolina, at least you know three feet because um, your your burrowing animal uh, vertebrates can really get down there. Uh, the other thing is something that would be difficult for an animal um, to or a digging pest to to really move, like using gravel or something more uh, heavier or sturdier that is, is a challenge for them to get through. Um, the only other thing I can think of that would be a, a deterrent for burrowing is again, utilizing pungent um, rodent repellents that would tell the animal like, hey, this isn't a good place to, to, to use. Um, I have been told, now this is something that, um, it's not research based and and there's no research that I'm aware of, but a lot of uh, some a lot of folks in a community garden that I used to work with would always put um, a sense of human scent, like human hair, uh, any sort of they would actually go to their barber shop and take all of the human hair remnants and scatter it around and said the smell of humans was a deterrent. Um, take it as you will, um, but they swore by it. So just, um, just putting it out there, but yeah, digging is definitely an issue for us as well. And we just keep filling it up and try doing it with, uh, and spraying deterrence that we hope will at least 
get the burrowers to go elsewhere. Fascinating. I'm going um, <laughs> to go get those. Little did you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, who knew? Um, this person says that they have heard of pest-resistant varieties of plants. Are they effective and what types are out there? Oh, very good question. Gosh, you guys are awesome. I love your questions. Um, yes, yes, there are there are definitely pest resistant plants and cultivars out there. And they go with diseases as well as insect pests. And what I can tell you is um, I spent a considerable amount of my PhD doing that very thing. Um, scanning and evaluating various accessions for resistance. And it is true, they do exist. However, I will say this, um, it, is, it, it is worthwhile to do mixtures um, so that we want to maintain the, the resistance of those uh, plants to whichever pests that you may be interested in. It is worthwhile to do a mixture because um, we also don't want to build up populations of the particular insect pest that can overcome the resistance to, um, you know, that, that is built in that host plant. Let me explain. So a great example is our, um, is our potato beetle. Um, potato beetles, um, Colorado potato beetle is a very smart, stinky little critter. Um, what the Colorado potato beetle has learned, it, it, it overwinters and it comes out in um, early spring and it starts feeding on newly emerging potato plants, right? And so it causes, it defoliates the potato um, and eventually that potato will die, plant will die. Well, what, over time, uh, a lot of our potato growers will put down um, insecticides, they put down um, fungicides, they put it all down so that as the potato uh, plant emerges, it'll have all that protection. Well, that potato beetle has learned that if I wait and emerge later and later in the spring, this is over years and years and years, um, that I the plant is le has less of that chemical in it for protection, and so I can feed on it and survive. And so now we've built up a resistant population of Colorado potato beetle. Now this is up north, you know, um, and they've been doing a lot of research on that. That being said, same sort of concept when it comes to. Um, you know, uh, roses that have black dot, you know, resistant to various um, fungal pests, fungal diseases, as well as pests. If we only plant that resistant plant and have it everywhere, that eventually there might be a mutation or a change in the population of the fungus or the pathogen that can then overcome that resistance. And so what we try to encourage people to do is, is try to do a diversity, a, a mixture, so that we can maintain that resistance as long as possible. I hope that makes sense. Um, but yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of um, issues with the leaf, boxwood leaf miner, and there are resistant varieties out there to the boxwood leaf miner. And so far, what I've seen is they do, they, they are looking much better than our susceptible varieties. However, given enough of a infestation, they will have a little bit of feeding and damage. But overall, they look infinitely better. Mm -hmm. Great question. That's, that's good to know. Um, we'll take one final question from our audience for today. Um, what can be done with a fleshy mushroom at the base of a huge oak tree? Yes. Get it identified, number one. Um, definitely need to know with IPM, we want to make sure we have a proper identification. If you can take a very good picture, uh, picture of the tree trunk, uh, picture of the actual mushroom, 
And if you have any particular damage that you uh, have observed uh, taking a picture of that, you can send that to your local extension uh, service. I, I don't know where you live, if it's Maryland, Virginia, uh, DC, and they are able to get a proper, um, they have the laboratory to, to uh, grow out the, fungo, uh, the fungus, should it be a fungus or a bacterium and get it properly identified. Once we know that, um, I say that because a lot of our tree species are susceptible to various fungal path root rotting pathogens. And some of them like Ganoderma um, and that one just comes to buy um, heter heterovacidian. Some of those, um, there is no cure. And the best thing that we can do is we can make sure that our oak is as, as healthy and giving it proper water, fertility as best and prolong its life. Um, so identification first, uh, treatment. Otherwise there are some other types of fungal um, root, root fungi that are totally beneficial, have no um, impact whatsoever. Um, so that, that's why I emphasize that. And if you are seeing a, a general decline of your oak, it is well worth making sure to get it identified and uh, uh, properly identified with your local extension agent. And also be aware that uh, root rots uh, and a lot of our tree species tends to be a complex of pathogens. So you may get um, a number of fungal species identified, but it also will tell you, you know, whether they're pathogenic or not. So I hope that helps. Well worth utilizing that, that service. Um, I think um, each state should have, should have a local extension service to help with diagnostic um, issues like that. Fabulous. Well, Thank you so much, Emily, for taking the time today to answer our questions and tell us a little bit more about Capital Grounds and Arboretum. And thank you everyone who attended today.